All right, everyone, we're going to be doing an ANSYS activity today. So if you want to open up Workbench and get that booted up, then we can kind of hit the ground running from there. Yep. I got a uh, firewall block um, when I tried to import the geometry. Oh, firewall. Uh, asking for admin access. I can show you what I did again. I'll just, um, I just right click this and then yep. I went here and then it popped up. I see that it opened, but I guess. Oh, you have to uh, you have to import it. We'll we'll, we'll go over it. Okay. So yeah, just just start a fresh project and then. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, it's uh, 5.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good, good to hear. Uh, so thank you. So for everyone joining virtually, thank you guys for switching over to the new Zoom link. Uh, so I know it's it kind of a weird thing to switch, but um, you know, I, I've, uh, I, I, I don't want to keep lugging my laptop around, and so I, I want to you know, use the computers here because they, they have a webcam set up. Uh, but I also didn't want it to record because uh, normally when I record, I have it save it. I have it saved locally on the uh, on the on the computer, but I don't want to do that on these computers. And so I'm, I switch it over to cloud saving. But in order to do that, I had to create a whole new meeting for it. And so, you know, it, it was kind of a mess. But you know, I, I I'm sorry, and I'm sorry for the inconvenience. But thank you guys for for joining. Okay. Um, and so I've been doing this for a couple of classes now, and so I I kind of like this. Uh, it kind of gives me more room to just kind of use on this on the lectern here instead of having my laptop just take up a huge space. You know, the only bad thing is I have this big ass monitor in front of my face. And so it's a little bit hard for the people here to kind of hear me. And so, you know, pros and cons, but you know, I think overall, I think it's a, it's a positive change. Um, okay. And so, um, you know, today, you know, as you can see here, we're doing our next ANSYS activity. Okay. And so, you know, if you look at the schedule for the class, you know, what I have planned is that, you know, we're going to be doing ANSYS every other week. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the, the whole point of this class is to really, you know, learn how to use ANSYS well. And so, you know, we're going to be using ANSYS a lot this semester. And so we're right on that Thursday where we're going to be doing our next one. And so here it is. Okay? And so the whole point of this activity is, is we're going to be doing an, 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 a finite element simulation on a bike crank. And so this is kind of what the geometry looks like here. Okay. Uh, and so we'll be learning a lot of new things in this, uh, in this activity. Okay. First of all, you know, I, I think probably one of the more important ones is that um, you know, we'll learn how to import like a, a CAD model that's already been generated. Okay. Uh, but we'll also learn how to, um, you know, first do a 3D simulation. So this is a 3D sim compared to 2D from before. Um, and then uh, we'll also learn how to specify material properties. So lot, lots of really good new information here um, that, you know, that we didn't cut, that we didn't get to cover on that first activity. Okay. All right, and so um, you know, I don't want to talk for too long, so I do want to get into it. But before um, before we go, are there any questions I can answer? All right, all right. So let's uh, jump right into it. And so you know, for those of you you know virtual and those of you here, you know, if you can launch Workbench, you know, that's um, that's going to be good because you know it takes a little bit of time to work, to launch Workbench, and so you know, launching it now will be a good thing. Okay. Uh, but as I just mentioned, you know, we're going to be doing a an anti simulation on this bike crank. Okay. And so, if you if you're unfamiliar with a bike with what a bike crank is, you know we're basically looking at this part right here that's circled in. in the okay, forgot that I have this tool right here. Okay, right. Uh, and so, you know, I, I chose this because it's I think it's one of the structurally I think it's one of the more simple simple um, parts of the bike, and so I think it kind of makes for a kind of a good kind of you know introductory exercise because we're still we're still kind of getting used to ANSYS in in all its features. Okay. Um, but you know, I think it's a little bit of a more realistic um, example than what we did on the first on the first day, which is just you know random plate with a hole. And so at least now this is actually a real object. Okay. Okay. And so you know, um, I'm going to have you guys download the CAD file, and so the CAD file is going to be available to you on the course website. Okay. And the other thing that the other new thing is that you know we're going to change the material properties. And so instead of just using the default material within ANSYS. We're going to be using a material called aluminum 6061 um, T6. Okay. And the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio is given by right here. Okay. And so we're going to learn how to specify a custom material property in ANSYS, uh, which is a which is an important skill because as you, you know, um, as you do, you know, finite element analysis with different materials, you need to know how to specify them. Okay. All right. And so first thing, let's let's go ahead and download the um, let's go ahead and download the um, the CAD file if you haven't already. Okay. And so if you go to the home page of our course website here on Canvas, um, I think the easiest place to find is if you click on assignments and then you go to um, Ansys Activity 2. In the description here, you'll see there are two CAD files. Okay. I want you guys to download this first one here called crankassembly.x underscore t. Okay. And so that's going to be the one that we're going to be working with today. Okay. All right. And so first, let's uh, let's learn how to actually import this into ANSYS. And so let's go ahead and um, go to Workbench. Okay. And then just like we did for the first activity, we're going to um, create a static structural analysis. Okay. And so I'm going to click and drag static structural over to the to the main workspace here. Okay. And then I'm going to come here to geometry. And then what I'm going to do is right click it. Okay. 
And then after right-clicking geometry, you're going to go to this um, um, to this option here called Browse. Okay. And what this will do is this will allow you to look um, onto the file system on your computer for the um, CAD file to um, to up to upload. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. And then let's go and load in the um, the crank assembly that you just downloaded from the course website. Okay. And so, um, if you um, if you did that, you should see a green check mark here. Okay. Okay. And so, if you have that green check mark, that means your your geometry was uh, imported successfully. Okay. Uh, and really, it's as, it's as easy as that. And so, you know, kind of the the way that you know Ansys is used a lot in um, you know in in uh, in industry and and even you know for research too, is that you'll develop your CAD, you'll develop your computer geometry, and some other software. And so a lot of times that's going to be SolidWorks, but you know it also works with like Katia um, or even Autodesk. Okay, um, just because those softwares have you know much more robust CAD CAD tools than than within Ansys. And then what you'll do is then you'll in, you'll then import um, that CAD file into Ansys, and then you can run your analysis from from there. Okay. All right. So was everyone able to import the geometry? Okay. So were there uh, any issues with the import? Okay. So everyone. Everyone good with the import? Okay, great, great, great. All right, question. So now, so if we make this in SolidWorks, do we need to export it as an X underscore T? Yeah, that's a good question. Oh, oh what's what? the other um, file? So the other file that's that's for um, um, that's for that's for the the homework. And so you know we're going to do everything in class on this file, and then for the homework, I'm going to have you do a little bit more analysis on that other file. So that other file is a CAD is a CAD file of the bicycle frame. Um, and so for homework, I'm going to have you do additional analysis on a bike frame in addition to the bike crank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, all right. So the question is, um, you know, do we have to do we have to export the, the CAD software as an X underscore T file, right? And so that's because that's what we have here for this. Okay. Um, and so this X underscore T here, this is known as a parasolid um, file format. Writing with the mouse is very difficult. Okay, and so this is something that'll definitely work, but it but it's not your only option for um, um, for importing SolidWorks files. Okay, and so the other options that that work really well is an IGS file. Okay, so IGS works really well. You can also do an STP file. Okay, and so the other the other CAD file I, I gave you of the bike frame, it's it's uh, it's given an STP format. Okay. Or you can do its cousin format, which is dot step. Okay. All right. So all of these file formats will work. And so the the unfortunately the only one that doesn't work is the uh, is the default SolidWorks part file format. And so I think that's SLD PRT um, you know format. And so Ansys doesn't uh, can't do can't use that because that's um, that format is proprietary to SolidWorks Incorporated. Okay. And so, if you want to, um, you if you want to actually use your SolidWorks part with Ansys, you have to save as one of these one of these um, one of these file formats. Okay. Um, and so, all of these work pretty well, but but personally, I think um, Parasolid I think works really well, and IGS. Okay. So these are these are the ones that I that I typically use for you know for, for my cases when I um, when I do stuff. But uh, but STP and, and step file work just as well too. And so. Um, you know, all of these will be fine. And, and if the geometry is not too complicated, then, you know, you won't see any difference between, between these guys. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and so that's uh, file formats. Okay. Let me go ahead and clear that. Okay. And so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, create a custom material. Okay. Um, and so this is something that we didn't do last time, because last time we kind of just used the default material within ANSYS. Um, and then we just kind of ran from there. But for this one, we need a um, a material that's um, you know that we're going to create on our own. Okay. Right. Technically, technically, Ansys does have aluminum there because aluminum is a very common material. But you know, just for the sake of uh, of education, you know, I'll show you guys how to make a material from from scratch. Okay. Okay. And so if you didn't catch what I just did, um, you know, what I did here was I went to engineering data here. Okay. And then what I did was I, I just double clicked this, okay? And so by double clicking this, you're gonna open up a new tab here um, for engineering data, okay? 
All right, so was everyone able to uh, open up this this screen here for uh, for engineering data? Okay, good. Okay, and so from here, you know, we're going to um, create a new material, right? And so first, the first place I want to draw your attention to is kind of this kind of middle top area right here. And so this and so this area right here basically tells us what materials do we have available right now, okay? And so right now we only have one material that's available, which is structural steel, okay? And if you remember from our first act activity, this is the material that we use for the uh, for the plate with the hole. Okay. Uh, but this time we need to create a new one. Okay. And so we're going to follow the tooltips here. And so you can see from where my mouse is, you can see that you can click here to create a new material. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. And so by doing that, um, you know, it's going to ask you to give your material a name. Okay. And so I'm going to give this, um, you know, aluminum 6061 T6, okay? Uh, but you can call it whatever you want. You know, this is your own custom material. And so you can name it for 6061 T6 if you want. And so, you know, there's nothing stopping you from that. But usually it, it's a good idea to name your materials after the actual material that you're actually using. But, you know, in reality, you can actually choose anything, anything. And so when you're done choosing the material name, you just have to hit enter. And you can see here that we've created a new material here called AL6061T6, okay? All right. Uh, and so after doing that, you'll notice that there's still a question mark here, okay? And what this question mark basically says is that, you know, ANSYS is basically telling you that you've only given your material a name, uh, but you haven't done anything else, okay? And so here we actually need to specify all of the, the material properties for this. Okay. And so now we actually need to, to start adding the material properties. Okay. Um, and so you can see here on the left side, these are basically all the options that you have available for, you know, defining the, the properties of your material. Okay. And so there's a lot, there's a lot that you can do. Okay. Because ANSYS is a, is a pretty, um, you know, a pretty diverse software that lets you simulate a lot of different things. Okay. Uh, but for a very simple material like this, you know, the only the only thing that we want to do here is um, linear elastic, okay? And so you're going to click on this drop down menu next to linear elastic here on the left side of the screen, okay? And you'll notice here that there are three there are three options. Okay, we have isotropic elasticity, orthotropic elasticity, and anisotropic elasticity. Okay. Um, and so for a simple metal like this, um, you know, we're going to characterize it as an isotropic elastic uh, material. And so with uh, aluminum 6061 T6 highlighted, you're going to double click on isotropic elasticity. Okay. And then after doing that, you'll notice that the bottom of the screen here is going to be populated with some more, some more stuff. Okay. Okay. And so if you click on this, uh, if you click on this plus arrow next to isotropic elasticity, you can see, you know, all the things that we need to fill in. Okay. And in particular, we're going to need to fill in a value for the Young's modulus and also a value for the Poisson's ratio. Okay. And so that's why these boxes here are highlighted yellow, because you need to define these quantities before you can, um, you can actually call this a real material. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so any questions on, on this so far? Okay, and so let's go ahead and define the Young's modulus. And so if we go back to our uh, project specifications, we can see here that aluminum has a Young's modulus of one times 10 to the seventh PSI, and then a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.33, okay? And so let's go ahead and import, uh, let's go ahead and input these um, quantities into ANSYS, okay? And so let's start with the Young's modulus. And so our Young's modulus is one E7 PSI, and so right now you can see that the P, that the Young's modulus is defined in terms of Pascal's, and so let's go ahead and change that. And so click on this, oops, click on this down arrow next to Pascal's here, and then let's change this to psi, okay? And that will allow us to define the Young's modulus in terms of in terms of those units. Okay? So let's go ahead and click that. And now that we've switched this to psi, we can go ahead and imp, uh, input <coughs> one e seven, okay? And then by doing that, you know, it'll define the Young's modulus, um, you know, in terms of PSI. So one E7, remember, is one times 10 to the seventh PSI. And then for the Poisson's ratio, we can go ahead and input that as well. 
And so our Poisson's ratio is going to be 0 0.33. Okay. All right. And so by doing that, you'll, you'll see that, you know, we no longer have a question mark here, right? And so remember, we had a question mark next to our material before. But now that we've given it the Young's modulus and we've given it the Poisson's ratio, it's a proper material property now. Okay. And so now we can actually start to use this for, uh, for analysis. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions on uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. And so that's and so that's it for defining a material property. So let's go ahead and close this um, close out of this. Okay. And so now we're back onto the uh, onto the workbench here. Okay. And now we're ready to um, you know now that we've imported the geometry and we've um, we've input our material properties. We're ready to actually start ANSYS Mechanical. So let's go ahead and double click on model right here. Okay. And then that's going to start up ANSYS Mechanical. And so you can click allow access or you know every everything that pops up. Okay. Just go ahead and give um, just go ahead and give ANSYS all your personal information. It's okay. <clears throat> yeah. You're getting a firewall thing too. Just close it. I think it, it worked if you just close it. Okay. Yeah. If you if you try closing it, then uh, then it, it, it might work. Um, but if you're if you're still having issues after closing it, then uh, then then let me know. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, can you click? Uh, what happens when you try to click allow access? Okay. Let me uh, let me let me go back there and check real quick. Okay, and so here we have our uh, here we have our geometry. Okay, right. and so here we have our bike crank. Right, and so you can see here it's it's actually comprised of three parts. And so we actually have an assembly of, of different parts here. Okay, um, but for this but for this analysis we're we're just going to use just one of these these parts. Okay, and so we're going to actually suppress some of these um, some of these parts. And so, if you're if you're unfamiliar with the term, um, you know, in in softwares like this, if you have multiple parts, uh, but you actually don't need them for your analysis, you can suppress them and you can basically hide them from the analysis. Okay. Okay. And so, if you go to the the left hand side here, if you go to geometry, you click on the plus arrow. Okay. You'll see you'll see the three parts of the assembly, right? And so, if you click on the different parts, you know, it'll highlight them for you in the uh, um, in the mechanical space. Okay. All right, and so the only one that we actually want here is this bike crank two rev twenty eleven x point three seven five. Okay, and so we don't actually want the pedal, and we don't actually want this uh, this guy right here. Okay, and so let's go ahead and suppress these. And so to suppress a part, we can go ahead and right click on the part, right, and then you want to click on suppress body. Okay, <clears throat> and if you read the tooltip for uh, for suppress body, you can see here that it it uh, removes the selected body or bodies from the analysis. Okay, um, and any corresponding other ob scoped objects are also affected. Okay, so let's go ahead and click um, suppress, <clears throat> and you can see here that the uh, the pedal is no longer part of our geometry. So, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. <clears throat> All right, so let's do the same thing for this uh, um, for this kind of connecting piece right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and suppress the body. Okay. And so after you do that, then you're just left with just the crank, which is going to be the part of our of our analysis. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so that's how you suppress parts. And so was was everyone able to suppress the uh, um, those two parts? Okay. In the chat doing okay? okay all right and so now that we've suppressed kind of the two parts that we don't need uh, we can go ahead and uh, assign a material to this okay because um, remember you know before we before we came in, in here we defined a new material called aluminum 6061 okay 
Uh, but we actually need to assign this material to the part of the model that we want to do it for, okay? And so with this bike crank highlighted here, so we'll go ahead and click this. If you come to the bottom left um, portion of the screen, you'll see this section here called material, okay? Right? Um, and under material, you'll see that the, uh, there is a, an option for assignment, okay? And so right now that the, right now you can see the assigned material here is structural steel, okay? And so if you click on this arrow next to it, you can, you'll be able to choose a different material for it. And so let's go ahead and click on the material that we just created, which is aluminum 6061 T6. Okay. <clears throat> right. And so from there, um, that'll, that will, that will allow you to, um, you know, now, now our, um, now our bike crank here is made of aluminum and it's going to um, deform and act like such. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so from here, um, you know, that's, that's basically all the new stuff in, in ANSYS that this, um, that this um, activity covers. So from here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you for a little bit. And so, um, you know, if you open up the PDF, then you'll see that, you know, from here, I have you go through the meshing and I go, have you go through the loads and constraints as well as the results. Okay. And so this, this part is, is more or less kind of the same as what we did last time. And so I, I do want to spend this time kind of going around helping people individually, um, as well as on Zoom as well, okay? Uh, but I'll help you get started, okay? Because okay. a lot of this, you know, a lot of this, I want you guys to kind of make these decisions yourself. But, you know, just to kind of get you started, I want you to make a, a method object, okay? I want you to create a sizing object, okay? Okay. And so those are the meshing options that I want you to do. For the, um, for the boundary conditions, I want you to create a fixed support somewhere. Okay? And I also want you to create a force boundary condition somewhere as well. Okay? Okay. And so I'm not going to tell you right now what, what you should do for these, because I want you to kind of you know, explore the software yourself and then kind of think back to what you did before um, you know, and what you should do here. Okay? And there's more instructions on the PDF as well if you want to look at that. Okay, but these are kind of the bare minimum of what you need in order to to run the simulation. Okay, and so right now all of these are question marks because I haven't actually defined anything for them. Okay, and so you're going to need to go through these, um, you know, go through these options here and actually, you know, select the select the part of the geometry that you know um, that that needs to be corresponding to these. Um, assign the appropriate, um, you know, parameters. Okay. Um, get a good mesh onto this guy because you know the default mesh that you're going to get is, is going to be not very good. Okay, um, and then apply your boundary conditions that's consistent with the um, uh, consistent with the activity. Okay, right. And then once you do those, you'll be able to view the results. Or actually, I'll, I'll show you what results that you need to. And for this um, activity, you're going to need the total deformation, and you're going to need the equivalent stress. Okay. All right, and so for the next, you know, 20, you know, 20, 30 minutes ish, you know, once you guys kind of um, play around with this, you know, try to set these, um, um, try to set these things and I'll, I'll, I'll walk around and go through Zoom and, and help anyone that's struggling, okay? All right, and so if you have any questions, you know, raise your hand and I'll come over to you. And if you're on Zoom, um, just say something in the chat and I'll, um, I'll, I'll help you out there as well, okay? All right, so go ahead and go to it. Oh, I see. 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 O
I think I think you might have some things disabled. So I um, can go ahead and click on view. Click on reset. Oops, there you go. Oh. And so um, and so yours yours is a little bit skewed, and so you're gonna have to uh, make this A column a little bit wider. Ah, because right now you're you're in um, design module, and so um, the materials that you assign those are actually in the camp. And so, because uh, because Antis it, it actually launches like a lot of different software at the same time. So this is this is the CAD software. So this is uh, so you can't run simulations with this one. And so that one is from uh, camp. So if you double click on, if you go back to work. Mm -hmm. If you double click on this model right here, four, then you're gonna you're gonna open up this one. Yeah, so you're gonna have to uh, there's you can't um, supply a text feature for the entire mesh, but you can click the text document. For sizing, you want to do the whole box because you want to apply the whole size. Yeah, so um, but for this one, you want to take stock. Yes. Yeah, because you want to do, you know, we'll, we'll discuss this over the next couple of Oh, hex agents are the same as hex dumps. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, and so that's that's true. And so you know, normally you you don't want to run the like some refinement of those, um, but for this one we're we're applying a different mesh that gives you higher. Uh, because you know, uh, one thing that you can do for the mesh is go ahead and click the whole box. Um, and so what you can do from here is that instead of automatic mesh, you can change that to yeah, click on the hex button. Okay. So we'll back into that. For a 3D object, if you, if you click on the change surface, that's going to be looking more stable. So you can put in that and it will open a refine around that. So So I have a question. Yeah. 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 Actually, let me let me make an announcement for So for uh, so if you look in the PDF, you know I, I'm asking you guys to do a hexahedron mesh, and so there there's no option for hexahedron in in Nancis, but you can select hex down, and that's that's kind of the next that's kind of the next step. So yeah, that's the one I want to use. All right, I've been ignoring Zoom. What you guys have here? My right, question: Does choosing quad tri versus all quad make a large difference for the free mesh types? Going to be yeah. So those are good questions. So to answer your first question, uh, Tristan, so the um, the quad or triangle that that determines the the mesh that you put on the on the exterior, and so those are kind of surface element types. Um, so quad tri um, helps to be a little bit more flexible. And that you know it'll it'll try to put quadrilaterals where it can, and then you know where it can't it'll put triangles. Quadrilaterals are, are a little bit of a better um, element type than triangles generally, just because it's it's more efficient. Um, if you if you try to do all quad, um, I haven't done too much testing with it, but I think it'll it might error out a little bit, um, or it might it, it might uh, give you some some issues. For this one, I don't think it'll give you issues just because it's it's a fairly simple geometry. But for more complicated ones, it might be a bit more difficult. <laughs> Um, and then your other question for the element order, 
Um, let's 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 save that discussion because I think that's that's a little bit of a longer one for um, for next week. And so that's when we'll we'll talk about element order a little bit. But generally, for for most structural simulations, you're going to want to pick quadratic, and then linear is better suited for like heat transfer or, or fluids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I get when I do a all quad with the mesh sizing I'm doing, yep. I get a, I guess like a not a full on error, but a semi error saying it didn't fit all quad free. Yep. And it created some triangles. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that because my sizing did be chosen better? Yeah, it's it's so um so quads, what that refers to is if you look at kind of the surface, mm -hmm. you'll see that you know most of the shapes are these kind of four four sided right. things. And so that's that's a quadrilateral. Uh -huh. And so if, when you're saying all quad, you want to put as many quads on the surface as possible. So for most cases, it's it's not going to be possible, especially for you know cases where you have right. a lot of curvature like this. Um, and so you, there's not really anything you can do about it. And so you still generate the mesh. It'll still generate the mesh. Okay. Yeah. So that's that. It's just a warning. So usually warnings, most of the time in in softwares like this, you can just ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but but for this specific instance, it's it's not that big deal because like, like you'll. You're undoubtedly going to have some triangle somewhere. Right, they can't it's, fit perfect. Yeah, unless it's a unless it's a perfect cube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's, I mean, it's gonna, it has to put some triangle in there. Okay. Yeah. So I'm inclined to force to to right here. Yeah. And you know, if I were to remodel this this model, I would put like a plane and top force here. But like if this looks over here too, does that mean that it's going to carry the whole thing? Yes. Yeah. So it's, so it's going to basically what's going to do is that when you apply a force boundary condition like this. It's going to distribute that force across all the surfaces that you select, and so it's, it's essentially going to be a distributed force. It's just it's going to be distributed across more of that surface. But in practicality, it's not going to be distributed. Right? It's not going to be on right here. These surfaces. Yes. Yes. In reality, well, it would just be on on the surface because that's that's where the pedal would kind of make contact. Right. Right. So do you expect us to do that? Like, is there a way to select like, only like this area from here, or do I have to go back to the model like with um, auto or something in here? Yeah, so if, if you wanted to be a little more precise, then you, you would have to kind of create like a, a surface kind of like yeah, that before. But for this for this activity, I think it's it, I don't think it'll make that. Okay. It, it'll make a difference kind of like around here, like a, a stress distribution around this whole kind of area here. But but overall, you know, for in terms of deformation, and actually for this one, you'll see a stress concentration kind of. Like then you know what you do here is as long as there is a force here, it's, it's not going to force. Okay. I don't really want to look it up here. Okay. Got it. Thank you. There's one on Zoom. And then I'll come, I'll come back around for a bit. Zoom question. Um, oh. Oh, that's weird. So when you, when you click on this sizing thing right here, you uh, you can't uh, you can't change this one here. Do you have uh, do you have this? Do you have this little P right here? Highlighted. Oh, okay. It it shouldn't be highlighted. Um, okay, that's good. So when you when you when you try to input something new, like you put five, and you hit enter, then it, it nothing changes. Hmm. Um, can you try changing the mesh size from here? So click on mesh over here, and then on the bottom of mesh, um, you can you can you can you can choose the size over here too. I think, oh, actually, if you, yeah, if you click on element size under defaults right here, you should be able to change it from here. Oh, okay, yeah, just, just type the number. You don't have to do anything. Questions back here? Yeah, so the, um, so when you, when you create a mesh with the white, like, you know how, you know how like, visual images have like, how many, it tells me how many pixels are there. And if you have more pixels in there, there's going to be a sharper, a sharper image. And so for a mesh, it's kind of the same thing. So the more mm -hmm. elements you have in the mesh, you're going to create a more more. It's, it's something that we, I, I think I mentioned very you know, very recently. Uh, but that's, that's usually the analogy that I can do when I create my mesh. Think of it like, a, you know, think of it as like creating like a digital image. More pixels you have, more elements, the, the better you're, the better the solution. That is that is the temptation. But when the more elements that you have, it's also going to make the simulation a lot more. 
expensive. And so, you know, just like you know, if you have like a super high risk and like it's paper out it's gonna create a lot of space in the desk which is uh, so same thing for finite elements. You have a lot of elements. The more elements you have in your bench, um, the more memory the assemblage is going to take, and the longer it's going to take to solve. So when you put solve for a really, a really you know, high density mesh, you know it might take somewhere on a few minutes, or even in the worst case, it can take ten hours. Or much more. So it's a trade-off of like you know, how much accuracy you want for zero performance. The other side actually. This this gets yeah, but you, you have to remember when you suppress the channel. So go to yeah. 
Uh, you, can, you can just switch between them. So if you uh, if you want to do like if you want to do the mesh side of the MM, you can do this one up here and then and then when you set the boundary you can just change. So it, it, it automatically converts everything like this. Yeah, it'll convert. What's up? Um, so if I want to add the requirement around these larger diameter holes here, yep. is it easier to add a requirement for each hole, or can I do this with one You can do them all with one, actually. So you can you can select multiple surfaces by holding control and then clicking. Okay, so yeah. Like all right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me check the chat. Sorry, chat. I was uh, gone for a bit. So the file is unrelated to the the home. So so this bike crank file you you'll need you'll need both files for the uh, for the home. So you need this one and also the bike frame. That I have up there too. So the bike frame is not only is not going to be used until the very last point. So you know most of this activity is going to be this bike crank. My right, question. So what does it mean when the part changes color when doing mesh uh, refinement? Um, Usually, usually when it changes colors, it'll tell you something like like up here. And so usually there'll be some kind of color legend about what the colors mean. Um, and so usually when you're when you're changing the mesh settings, it'll say that like a certain mesh is like obsolete at this point, just because you you change the settings. And so that's that's usually nothing to worry about. And so as long as you update the mesh, and so you right click mesh, and you click generate or update, then that'll you know that'll resolve any any issues. Yeah. Um, but if you click on generate mesh and update, and then, you know, the color still stays the same, um, and it still says, you know, there's still some obsolete meshes, then, you know, then something, then probably something's wrong with that. So actually, what I was going to say, um, there's kind of a, a very um, systematic way to tell if you're doing it. Like, it's called mesh. And so if, you're, if your stress distribution looks smooth, so you have a smooth transition point, and you can do um, more of the next step. That's not the match So um, the issues kind of show up is when your your stress distribution comes from you start to see that, then that really tells you that visually you know this is all the time and it doesn't have to be that the stress distribution. Thank <laughs> you. 
this is what's going to take care of This is where <coughs> Okay, great. All right, guys, it's 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 six fifteen, so we have about thirty more minutes. So how's how's everyone doing on the activity so far? So I, I'm looking around, and I see quite a few simulation results, and people are, are are advancing pretty well. So looks good. Okay. And so if you if you have results already for uh, for problem four, you know, feel free to continue on with the activity. Um, and so the the main part of this activity is actually going to be problem five. And so. Um, let me let me stop you guys for a second just to just so I can show you. Okay. All right. And so the main part of this activity is actually going to be this guy, problem five. Okay. And so for this one, I, I want you guys to use your finite element setup to find the maximum load on the on the bike, on the bike crank. Okay. Because under the default settings, I'm I'm asking you to supply a load of 100 pounds. Okay. And so for this part, I want you to, you know, basically take those results and use them to determine when the bike is going to fail. Okay. And so in this part of the problem, I tell you that the bike crank has a yield strength of 35,000 PSI. Okay. And so what that means is that, you know, once the maximum stress, the maximum equivalent stress in your bike crank reaches above 35,000 PSI, that means your bike crank is going to fail. Okay. And so, um, you know, I, I want you guys to look at kind of the results that you have um, either right now or, or you're going to get very soon. And so if your maximum equivalent stress is above 35,000 PSI, then the crank is going to fail, okay? Um, oh, and actually you're gonna be working with a safety factor of two. And so, uh, and so your maximum stress actually shouldn't exceed 35,000 divided by two. And so that's gonna be 17,500 PSI. Right, so look at so look at your simulation results and see if it uh, if the if the maximum equivalent stress exceeds seventeen thousand. Um, if it doesn't, that's great. Then your bike crank is still okay. And then what you can do then is you can increase the load, you can increase the force until you have a maximum stress of seventeen thousand five hundred. Okay, but if you find that your bike crank is already failing under that one hundred pounds, then what you can do is you can decrease the force until you reach a maximum stress of seventeen thousand five hundred psi. And so no matter, no matter what, basically, I, I want you to basically find the force um, that you can apply onto the pedal, which, you know, which will cause you to you know, have, the, have the bike crank fail. Okay? And so the way that you do that is you, you go to your force boundary condition here. Let me switch this to components. And you can, change, you can just change this manually. Okay? And so in the default, you can change this. Actually, let me change this to pounds. Okay? And so you, know, you can change. This is going to be 100 pounds. Okay? And then, you know, let's say that, you know, for this, for this case, I found that hundred pounds is already going to break the bike crank. Okay. What I can do then is I can just lower this. Okay. And so let's change it to 90 pounds instead. And then I can rerun the simulation. Okay. And then after rerunning the simulation, I can check the stress field. And then if I see that the, uh, that the bike crank is still failing, then I can just lower this again. Okay. And so it's, it's a manual process of changing this boundary condition, running the simulation and see what you get. And then kind of repeating this until you get until you reach this number. Okay. And so this is probably where you're going to spend a lot of the time on this on this project, or, or maybe not, because it's only one number. Okay. Um, but I but this is kind of the main thing for this assignment is to find out, you know, when is the bike crank going to fail? Okay. Uh, so does that make sense to everyone? Are, are there any questions on, on that? Okay. All right. And so, so try to get as close as you can. And so, you know, there, there is a, there is a load number that, that gets you pretty close to 17,500. So, you know, try to get as close to that as you can with your, you know, with your force. Okay. Okay. And so I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep walking around. And so, you know, for Zoom people, if you have questions, you know, put in the chat, you know, I'm, it's the, so the Zoom is projected onto the projector. And so I can see, you know, when, when someone puts a chat there, so, you know, I can see that, but if you're in the classroom, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll come to you guys. Okay.
yeah, yeah. yeah. And so you, and so you put the pedal or the crank is going to be kind of like this. The pedal is going to stick out. Right, right. And so, you know, the crank is actually going to rotate all the time. So it's going to be. And so I, I, and so, you know, I want you to think of this. What's the worst in that whole case? Of, you know, the person pushing down on this bike that's going to be a little different. So, what, what direction is the force you go? Yes, and so um, so basically the most dangerous case is kind of that's going to cause the bike uh, to bending so that you can be the most the most dangerous looking for yourself later. So um, when you're applying the force, you can apply it on you can, you can choose any surface in here. Any, any, anyone that's 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 all. Um, but uh, you want to apply it in the actually you can you can run different ones. Okay. So you can run it uh, with this configuration. You can see what the stress is for. But then also try a hundred pounds of all that. But it's okay. So it's uh, yeah. So so for the deformation, it's it's usually it's usually fine. So I, I would only just focus on stress. This this looks pretty. This looks pretty. Actually, this looks really good too. But around these holes, you can see that on the clear area, there's more stress concentration. But it is a pretty smooth transition between the red, orange, yellow. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. I think the mesh is good. Yep. Um, I'm trying to set my force here in, I guess, the y direction. Yep. Um, I'm trying to apply it like this. Is that correct? Yep. Or, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not applying it just to the, to the front face and not applying it in the y direction. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so so actually, you know, if you kind of remember, the pedal used to be used to kind of come out right here. Right. And that, the force is actually being applied on the pedal. And then that force is going to be transmitted through the pedal, you know, to these inner surfaces. So actually, you know, probably the better surface would be kind of one of the inner ones. Inner ones, because you know, the pedal will be there. And then... Exactly. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. For this one, I think it doesn't matter too much. I, I think you'll get very similar results from up here. But, you know, if you want to be a little bit more exact, then something on the inner surface. I might try to All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, that's no, a good question. Uh, yeah, a couple other people have been asking about that too. So you're right. And so normally, you know, that pressure or the force would just be applied to this pedal. So that's that's the one where you push it. Uh, and so there there is a way to kind of break up a surface like that, but it's a little bit annoying. You, you kind of have to do it in in design modeling. And so for this one, you kind of make the assumption that you just apply it on this entire. Thing. Uh, so for this one, it's, it's not going to make too much of a difference, but because you have this very profound, profound neck. Your stress is your stress concentration is that can be here. And so and so kind of the finer details of how you define the force here, it's not going to have too much an impact. It'll make it'll make some impact, but not too much. Uh, for this for this activity, it's fine for this to be Yeah. Uh, 
actually for this one, so this is this is actually where the the, the, the crank is going to attach to the block. Um, and so if you remember, yeah, yeah. So if you remember, you know, the pedal that was suppressed was on, was on this side. Um, if you unsuppress that for a second, it's right there. And so the first one support is actually going to be. Um, so. So that these two holes are actually. Yeah. So here's so here's you know even though you know even though the bike. Is technically moving, but this is where it's, it's kind of fixed. Yeah, these two. Yeah, you can either do those two or you can do all three. If you want, but you, but you should have to have some. This should just be those two. There's probably only like two points in the direction. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, actually, I actually think that's, that's that's probably better. Okay. Oh, and so then when I, uh, sorry. Um, when you don't fight the force, you know, like you choose this space and then the direction of y, in y direction or w. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. So what? So what Dean was saying a couple of was that you know what people imagine is that when you push down on the pedal, you know, it's actually only being applied on this kind of this, the bottom face here, mm -hmm. and so it's a little bit of an assumption to apply because you what you see is that when you try to click on the surface, it's going to select this entire one. Yeah. And so it's a little bit of an assumption, but for this activity, it's not going to make that big a difference. But your your main your main area of interest is going to be the function. So kind of the finer details of what you do here is not going to make that. So, so it's not going to have a picture. Either either way is fine. And so you know this this part is kind of symmetric across this half sentence. And so you can either do it force this way. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of these, all of these are fresh. Yeah, so when you when you apply a force like this, it's, it's basically going to distribute that force across all the different surfaces like that. And so if you don't select this one, it's going to put a higher force on the uh, surface that you didn't have. So Yes. And so if you look at the look at the equipment, so for this one, you know, it's actually it's actually kind of interesting. Because you because you actually do have some stress concentration. And so probably what's happening is that when you when you don't include the surface, then these stress concentrations are a little bit higher. So that this is this is where the stress is concentrated. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that's that's not surprising. But then because you know, because you're applying a force boundary. Uh, so basically, the more area that you give the force, then it distributes that force across. And so, with and so, when you disinclude this one, you have less area, and so you have more force on your surface. So I think that results in higher stress. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. So, you go on. Ah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so because, because you're applying the force in that direction, it's kind of like bending it. So, you know, a lot of, because you have kind of this edge right here with the fixed support, that you're going to get stress concentration. Um, just so that edge is kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of perpendicular to the direction. Um, and so for, for this for this activity, kind of remember what we want to do with this point. So, I mean, this crank here represents it. So the pedal's coming up this way. And then when you apply the 100 pound load, you, know, you think it's realistic to apply the load in this direction. That's true, but it's uh, but like this, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but usually, you know, usually it's, it's not going to be experienced not that much. So for this one, uh, you know, a little better to apply the force at the point. That's the direction of force after. That's kind of what you're calling. Let's try that one because then, because of, and the reason I, I didn't do this. Is because we have this uh, stress concentration. So when you apply it in the y direction, you kind of have this rounded surface here. So you kind of you kind of know, so you kind of get the stress concentration over here. So this so this is actually a big issue that we're going to talk about later on in this next we'll talk about more things like that. We're going to have stress concentration. That's that's usually bad, but that's if you keep refining the mesh here, you're going to 
that stress is too small. And basically have like a very short stress. So if you find the y direction, the yes. exactly. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. um, for the snapshot that you want us to be taking of our, our support and our source added, yep. um, I don't think this shows it very well. I mean, I added it. it's constrained here. I don't know if I could just take a snapshot. If you click on static structural A5, this will show you kind of everything. And so if you zoom out, you can see they're, they're marked by letters. Okay. And I can I can see the red area. Okay. And you don't mind if I just do a figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Perfect. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's correct. And so what the deformation, so I think internally what you're thinking of is actually strain. And so strain, and so I think so you're right. I think the maximum strain is going to be this middle right here. But that's that's where the net is where the net is. But deformation is literally just measuring, you know, what's the starting point of where this was, and then after you run the simulation, how far did it travel? And so because this is at the very end right here, away from the big support, yeah. that's where the, the beam is, you think that the beam is actually bending down to this. And so that's why you have an active there. Uh, but you can use strain to actually do like that once you put it here. Strain, you can do, just do equivalent to strain. And so you'll see that this maximum strain is going to be the same here. Right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think it's one that I want everyone to ask at some point in this process. But when you have smaller and smaller elements, what happens is that you have more and more elements in your mesh. And so the more elements you have in your mesh, it's it's going to make the simulation take longer. It's going to make it take up more memory. And so like right now, if you click, like you go to your work, you go to the and you click so. So let's put my well. Uh oh, I guess I just saw. Oh, okay. I just saw. I see. But well, when you click solve, you know, it's only a couple few seconds. And so the more elements that you put in there, that few seconds is going to turn into you know, few minutes. So if you add more, the few minutes is going to turn into a few hours. And so it's for, for, the, for the scale of problems we're doing in this class, you're never going to get to the point where it's like way too many elements that you're waiting so long for the simulation. But for practical FDA, like basically, like you're, they run simulations with like millions, of, you know, sometimes billions of elements. And so the difference between like simulation taking, you know, a day versus simulation taking a week. So that's those are kind of the issues that you're So the it depends on what your it depends on the analysis that you want to do. So you know for some like you you really do need that extreme accuracy, so you really need to run it up really high. And for those, you know, you can wait. I've seen simulations that take up, you know. So they literally send it to a some. And it's not even on a desktop network, they send it to like supercomputer, like, you know, hundreds, thousands of processes that are dedicated to simulation. And it still takes like three weeks. And so, you know, so those are like, those are the creme of the creme, like, those are really expensive simulations. And so for those ones, it's okay because you're trying to find like turbulence. You know, for something like this, usually, you know, as long as you can get your results to your boss by the day, I'm dedicated to which is, you know, depends on what company you're reporting that. Mm -hmm. 
what does it define it there? So like if I put a refinement there, so it's going to be a small number. Yep. And then for at the end of the day, it's not going to be a significant difference from what we get. Oh, it's here, right? Yeah. So for so so far, you know, I, I've given you kind of two very tame problems so far. And so, you know, what I've been showing people is that if you look at the stress distribution here, you'll see that there's a very smooth transition point. So you go from red to orange to yellow. Yeah, very smooth. And this work has very smooth. Yes. And so this tells me that the mesh already looks pretty good. So if you refine any more, you're not going to see. But what can happen sometimes is that, you know, if you have like, like, a, like a stress concentration here, and it goes from red to blue to orange. And so you see it's kind of like, I call it squatty. And you'll see basically that from element to element, you're kind of jumping around. That's what you want to refine that. Okay. So you can use the fast one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Time. All right, did you see a question on Zoom? Oh, All right, we're back. Zoom people. Yes, yes. So you, you can you can change the units. And so you know if you're uh if you're in ANSYS, and so I know for the for the mesh, I think people are, are putting the mesh in terms of um in terms of millimeters just because it's convenient. But when you're applying the force, you can actually change the units to, to feet um, or pounds. Right? And so you, you can do this as many times as you want in ANSYS Mechanical. So whenever you change the unit system, it's automatically going to convert everything that you have into those units. And so you can see right here that right now I'm supplying the force in terms of a 90 pounds. Okay? And so uh, when I change the units to, when I change the units to, let's say, Newtons, okay? You can see here that it automatically converted it from 90 pounds to minus 400 units. And so you can keep switching the units, you know, willy nilly, you know, just based on whatever is most convenient to you at the time. And it's going to convert everything else for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So for, for this uh, for this activity, you know, definitely, definitely switch over to quadratic. And so if you go over to your automatic method here, um, you're, you'll see the setting here for um, element order. Okay. And you want to make sure that you are um, using quadratic. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll go over the reasons why for this, you know, over the next couple of weeks, you know, because starting next week, we're going to start getting into, you know, uh, more of the nitty gritty, like, you know, what do the, what what the different settings do? But generally for structural simulations, you want to use quadratic functions. Quadratic tetrahedral are, are, are okay, but the, the ones you want to avoid are linear tetrahedral. Yeah. On automatic, what would ANSYS choose? Um, I would hope, I'm actually not sure. So I, I would hope that ANSYS would choose, um, you know, a, a quadratic element for, for this one. Um, but quadratic elements are also more expensive generally. And so they might pick linear by, by default. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, don't, don't leave anything to chance. And so if you can set something that, uh, you know, that you know better that, that you, than you know better than ANSYS, then I would go ahead and set it for yourself. Yeah. All right, guys. So we, we're almost out of time for today. So there's, there's about one more minute of class left. And so, you know, like I, I've, I've told this to, you know, um, you know, if, if you have, if you haven't been here at the end of class, I'm, I'm personally okay with you guys staying in here after class. Um, to continue working on it because I don't think there's a class after this in here. And so feel free to stay here to work on this if, if you want. Um, but the only thing I ask is that if you're the last person in here, just make sure you you close the door and make sure it's off and then turn off and turn off the lights. Okay. Um, but I, I will I do have to head out today at 645 just because I, I do have another engagement later on. So I'll, I'll answer I'll do one more round of questions and then we'll wrap up today. Okay. And so if I don't get back to Zoom, so thank you guys for tuning in today. You know, hope you guys enjoyed the activity. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys next week. Okay, so I'll do I'll do one more round of questions, and then I'll. Okay. Yeah.
because like I'm looking at the Um, so for, for this case, you know, let's, let's look at let's look at how this side is. You'll see that it's perfectly symmetric. And so for this case, it actually doesn't matter. We're going to get to the same. So one for one case, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is on my window list, right? Okay. And I'll be whatever working. So this is the one where you can't, you can't maximize it at all? No, I can't do anything. So it's basically minimizing it. When I, check that, it's like, I think it's something to do with the resolution, but I can't do anything with the resolution oh. settings. So this is what I, and I, oh. I project this onto a secondary monitor, like a 27-inch, yeah, yeah. and it shows up even smaller in comparison. You okay. Know I mean? okay. So, I don't know if I can try to talk to IT about that or if it's yeah. on Windows Mac. Let me, um, if you can, if you can send me just a couple of screenshots of this and then um, send to me and I'll forward it to IT. Yeah. And because I, I know the guy that that worked on the VCL, and so okay, um, then he can. I think he's, he'll probably know the best. Because it, it's it's something I can't recreate. So I, I tried it on my laptop. I tried it on my desktop machine. I, I don't. I can't recreate this. And so yeah, but he but he would probably know. So send me a couple of screenshots and I'll send okay. it to him. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hang on. Let me uh, let me answer the Zoom questions real quick. Okay. Just thank you. Okay. You can send it as a or you can upload it to one of our. Yeah. 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 And so that will. So one drive is basically the and so it'll it'll send you the link, it'll basically send you the link to the one drive, and then you can grab it from that. It's like I I was unsure the first time it was because normally you have to take but the process will take. So problem number six is a uh, oh 
Uh, and so for this one, because uh, because right now you're playing the nose correctly. And so for problem six, what I want you to do is I want you to switch the direction to be to make to make it so that the light frame is in touch. Yes, yeah, so I, so I think that's the negative So if you change from those to be like negative 100 pounds, you need to Yes. Yes. And so, because now this, 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 because now instead of in bending, this place the bike frame can pull the pressure. So, you know, you're going to get a different, um, you're going to get different um, stress balance. And so, what you should see is that it should be able to maintain higher amounts of load and compression because it's a different load. Yes. Yes. So, if you, if you scroll through, actually, yeah. So, this is the one I want to scroll. So, when you check the equivalent stress, you should see that um, yeah, no problem. Um, if the equivalent stress is over 35,000 divided by two, because this is this is the yield strength of your scale. So once the stress reaches this point, then the mixture is But what I want you to do is I want you to do the same thing that after that. And so you're going to divide this by two. Mm -hmm. And so once the stress reaches 17,500, then it's going to be And so I want you to find the load. Um, yeah. The load that's going to cause basically the stress to reach more than that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I, uh, I, I I meant to get back to you. Um, yeah, because the uh, pitch conserves to the metric on the time impact, this just makes the problem is that more the department chair, so it's just that it's possible to let her stop the pieces. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's what I was going to tell you is that you know when 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 you do sign up for the thesis class, there is some flexibility. And so I, I, I am able to um, basically set the amount of units that the, that the research is for. And so normally normally I do three three, so three three units in one semester, three units for the next one. But we can do all six in one semester. But you know if we are going to do that, then. You know, I want to finish up at the quite the end of next summer, right? And so, you know, if you that would work, I, so I've done that for one student, but he, <clears throat> but he basically worked full time on the research, so he wasn't taking any classes for, for the semester. But just the only thing I'm concerned about is that it's, you know, it does take quite a bit of time to like, you know, get up to speed with the tools, find a project that's actually, you know, that's actually, you know that you're passionate about that actually contributes to the, to the field then after you do the research because you know you're going to be running into a lot of issues so the thing with research is that it's you know, I'm, I'm not we're going to meet weekly um, but it's not something that i'm going to be there with you every step of the way that stuff and so there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff you have to do on your own to kind of struggle with it and that just kind of naturally takes so with the shorter project cycle i, I am i am usually a little bit concerned that you know we're not going to get to the point by the end of next summer where you have kind of significant results. But you know, I'm, I'm willing to try. Um, you know, if you if you know, yeah. So you know, I I am willing to try, but you know, it, it is going to be a pretty big mile, and it's going to be such a time. Like, in the so let's try. Just sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. I mean, so, so did you get a chance to do the tutorial on that? So, that's okay. I'd like to run it this week. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. But yeah. I've read one of the uh, papers that you've said, I think it's quite complicated. Okay. But it's, okay. But it's all good. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, do the tutorial for sure. I mean, I, I would prioritize that just because, you know, likely, you know, for, for kind of the, the time frame that you're looking at. I'd probably have you work on something with that software because that software's kind of already made, so there's not really much problem there. Right. And so I would prioritize that and then kind of read the paper back on the side. So once you get the tutorial done, then I can actually start doing stuff. Right. Uh, so okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Let me use some. 